no one wanted to really pay for it because mm. paying five dollars a month for like personal notes online just seemed like idiotic hello and welcome back to indie bites the podcast where i bring you stories of fellow indie hackers in 15 minutes or less today i'm joined by josh ho who is the founder and ceo of referral rock a sassy founded in 2014 doing over two million a year in revenue Josh has decades of experience as a founder, pouring his early entrepreneurship energy into a notes app, which he ultimately couldn't monetize and it failed. But before we get into this chat with Josh, I wanted to thank today's sponsor for supporting the show, which is Email Octopus. Email Octopus is an indie email marketing platform built to support other small growing businesses like yours. They are focused on affordability and ease of use, which is perfect when you're starting out as a bootstrapper. Email Octopus contains all of the features you need to reach and grow your audience. You know what? You can start today without paying a penny on their free plan where you can contact up to 2,500 subscribers. And I've taken advantage of this myself by launching the Indie Byte, my new companion newsletter to go along with the show. To try out Email Octopus and subscribe to the newsletter, head to emailoctopus.com or hit the link in the show notes. Now let's get into this conversation with Josh Ho of Referral Rock. Now, Josh, you've been doing Referral Rock since 2014. So that's almost a decade. And you're doing over 2 million a year? That's crazy. But what were you doing before Referral Rock? Just before Referral Rock, I was doing consulting. So software consulting I had as a holdover that was just slightly preceding that was another startup. And that's the one I quit my job as my last W-2 job for someone else back in 2007. I believe wow. is when I quit my job to do what was called Ubernote in the early web 2.0 days. And then when Ubernote died, <laughs> I'll just say, and, and didn't quite make it. It's also a similar time frame when I like got married, started a family. So, and yeah, I did consulting while just waiting my time until I figured out what was my next SaaS move, so to speak. You wrote an article which was fantastic about some of your reasons, but why did Ubernote fail and how have you sort of taken those learnings into your next projects? I mean, it was a combination of things. It was like a lot of big mistakes that I think people are trips now, like timing was a big part of it. So it was actually the time when we released it, when we first started it, we were one of the first early online web note types of things, like actually ranked number one for online web notes. We had a web version before Evernote in those days. So like Evernote kind of took the cake at that point in time. But one of the biggest things is we didn't think mobile was going to be a thing. <laughs> like, so we were like, hey, we're just going to be desktop. You know, the whole impetus was like, oh, you have your home computer and your work computer. Like I want to access my personal notes from both asynchronously. So that's what we built. And challenge was it was prosumer, what would, what would people call it now, or, you know, B2C type of thing. And no one wanted to really pay for it because mm. paying $5 a month for like personal notes online just seemed like idiotic. We didn't think it was, but you know, we didn't really go to the market first. It was, it was, it was a personal thing. It was like, we were heavy note takers. I'm still a heavy note taker. I use multiple apps to do all the stuff now, but you know, you look at the people now notions dream. That's like what we, that was like our business plan was all of that stuff. And we raised some like angel funding and did an accelerator in, in the Washington DC area in 2009. And that was when everything just bottomed out. So it was like, no investors. Like we, we would, we went on pitch, we got calls with investors. We went on pitches and like no one funded. So we tried to flip the bit and started charging people. No one paid for it. Mm. And we kind of just hobbled along for a little while, still using it ourselves. And yeah, it just kind of had the slow death of just having a project that you don't want to quite kill, but it's just, it's there lingering. Did you go straight into Referral Rock after? How did that idea come about? Yeah, it was probably around 2012 to where we really kind of quit Ubernote, I yeah. would say. And I think we saw the servers running for a little while. I got married in 2009, so I, I started having kids. And at that time, and, and I just like, it was just lingering. And I started doing some consulting to make money. And the, in that period, that's where I decided, I'm like, okay, well, after I kind of got over the burnout of Ubernote dying, because it was just such a drain. It was such a huge part of my life. And all of a sudden you're like, it's not going anywhere and it's not doing anything. Mm. 
So once I finally kind of quit that, it was like taking a step back and, you know, what can I learn from it? And one of those things is I liked SaaS. I liked SEO. I liked marketing because we had, I think, well over, it might have peaked at 100,000 users at some point. So we, we found a way to get to the market and get people to sign up. We just, it just wasn't worth paying for people at that point in time. So after that, I just was like, SaaS is the thing. Like I have this dream of I can build software that people are going to pay for on a subscription basis that is run through servers. They will make money by people paying five or $10 a month. And it can be me coding the software and having maybe a few people help me with support and that's living the dream. So what, where was the idea for a Feral Rock? I stumbled upon it by just sitting in a car dealership and I saw a, a person walk in and essentially talk to a salesperson. And they said, oh, so-and-so sent me because I'm looking for a Honda. They said to come talk to you. Mm. And the guy looked like, huh, who are you talking about? And they're like, oh, so-and-so. And then he just snapped to it and just got into sales mode. And I just was sitting there like a fly on the wall watching while I was drinking my coffee. And I'm like, what happened there? Like there was a referral, there was like some sort of exchange referral type of thing. And I was like, how do they track that? Like I've seen Dropbox, I've seen PayPal was a big one that did it in the early 2000s, like giving cash for referrals. I was like, who's doing it for these like, you know, non-internet businesses, these person to person ones that still exists, right? So I did a quick search and didn't find any competitors and, and mostly saw e-commerce types of referral programs like referral candy, all these other friend buy was big then, but they were all just focusing on e-commerce. I'm like, well, who's doing it for the yoga studio down the street? Who's doing it for the car dealerships and that type of thing. So that was the, the born impetus and started talking to a couple businesses and friends of mine and just seeing, you know, if they thought that was going to be a thing or not. That makes so much sense. And your pricing now, it starts at $200 a month. So it's like, it's not a cheap thing for these businesses to purchase. So you, was it sort of around that price when you started? And how were you pitching the value to customers? It started at $50 a month. Okay. And, and yeah, so it was that was the initial target was those types of businesses. And I quickly realized those were too small. Like most of them actually didn't even find the value because it was like, oh yeah, I already get five or 10 referrals a month. And, you know, they might be not to discredit them at all, but more mom and pop, like one, you know, maybe five employees, maybe two employees, maybe just themselves. And, you know, their businesses run mostly on just regular word of mouth, having, a, they didn't have email lists. They didn't have anything digital to kind of hook up to this type of thing. But once we got out there in marketing and, and we did a good job on SEO and inbound, when people started coming in the door and I started talking to people, different customers, like I started talking to businesses I barely knew existed. So one big one that even caused the first price dump was a water filtration company. So that found out that they, they valued basically getting a new customer at probably a few thousand dollars. And to them, getting two or three new referrals a month was like a huge ROI for them. But once you talk to them and they say, oh, it's a $50 product, they actually looked at it with like very skeptically, like yeah. that is almost too wide of a gap on ROI that I'm actually unsure if this is going to be sustainable for you. So, Well, it's going to be hard to distill sort of eight years of growth into this <laughs> short episode. Sure. But I wonder if there's anything or any bits of advice you can pull out through the years of what's worked for you in terms of growth and marketing that people might be able to use in their own products. I would say the biggest thing is to really focus on your own data, right? Like focus more trust on the things you're seeing and whether it includes, you know, customer interviews or listening or just looking, looking at your own chat support requests. And especially these days, like less worried about what everyone else is doing. Like once you get going and once you have a little bit of flow to you, like customers coming pay attention to like what they're saying and look, use those to direct you that I, I did that pretty well early on because, you know, I think all indie hackers have a, have a rogue mentality to them a bit. So it's almost like I was almost rogue from the other indie hackers. Just like, Oh, they're doing that. But it's like, eh, is that really going to work? I don't know. Let me go. And look. but, but I still backed it, not just on my impulses, but also backed on like the data. So I'm a big you know, from the engineer perspective, love the data, like archive way too much data that I don't even sort through enough of. But there's a lot of insights there. And I think if you build those habits early on to, especially with like the economy now, not like, oh, the economy looks like crap. It's like, look at your own data. 
you make your own moves based off of those. Use those other influences and, and metrics and benchmarks as guidance, but t- take your first party information and, and make decisions off of that first. When you say uh, your data and first party information, what, what do you sort of mean by that? Where, where do you find that? What if you have nothing to sort of go on? I, you, got, you got to start somewhere. So it's whether you, when you have your product, you get it hopefully out there, you know, you get people, whether it's conversations on Twitter, whether it's people, you know, talking to you and, or I would say don't hide behind like just a sign up page. Like you need to talk to those people. And I know indie hackers are oftentimes the whole reason they built the business is so they don't have to talk to people. But if you want to get it off the ground, you got to talk to them and understand where product and value meets, you know, with those customers. So that might mean, you know, zoom calls, it might mean live chat, you know, there's, you're going to do something you're comfortable with, but the, those are the tied data points that I'm talking about that you just start to see these trends. And it's not going to be like, you know, one customer is asking for one request. It's like, okay, great. Let me pump the brakes. Let me just see if other mm-hmm. customers are going to ask by that and log that and try to figure those, those pieces out. It's like a puzzle. And those are the, the inputs and the, the things that are flying at you that you got to figure out. What other marketing tactics do you think are working now these days? You've got your own podcast called Marketing Retro where you're talking about this stuff that other indies might want to implement. I mean, marketing is hard, right? And I, I feel like once I picked a tactic, I already had some strength in doing SEO types of things and hopefully goes into your factoring of deciding what to build is knowing that there are people out there looking for it. So if there are, whether how big or how small it is, and there's like people querying for something like your service, I mean, that definitely gives you a leg up to get started, especially for an indie hacker and and just having some organic traffic coming that way. And the only other one that I haven't personally done, but I have seen other indie hackers do very well is the community side. But once that flywheel gets going and they get in the habit of, participating in communities and people know in the right communities that they could have potential business relationships with like, you know, that that's another great way to just get yourself off the ground. And after that, you start to get more optionality. Josh, I wonder if I can find any jeopardy in your story over the last eight years of running Rafael Rock. Have you had any challenges, things gone wrong that you've had to overcome? Yeah, definitely. I would just say the First few years went pretty well. And then I would say over the past last year was probably the, my most challenging year where it got to the point where since everything was running reasonably well, we were growing 50% a year. At some point, we took our eye off the ball of what was really working. And I think, you know, mm-hmm. we knew what was working and what got us there, like the SEO stuff and a strong sales motion and all these things. And we hit this point where we had great people, but they got tired of being here and they wanted to move on with their career somewhere else. They didn't want to move into like leadership roles and not everyone does. So we hit this like two year mark of where all these service people, all of a sudden, just what we thought was a solid thing, it would kind of go forever. Mm. Like all these great people left for other careers and other places, you know, not a sad leaving or a firing or anything like that. They just needed to move on. And that was okay. It sort of drained our swamp, so to speak, or not swamp, our, our brain, <laughs> our brain capacity and a lot of Intel and a lot of things. And we were always building systems and things like that. But a lot of this happened over the course of a six month period. And it, we took a big step back mostly because yeah, just learning of natural career attrition that honestly just didn't even think about that was going to happen so Mm. at your stage around two million a year Mm -hmm. it's often where you get thoughts of raising or scaling further has that ever come across your mind with the fro rock have you raised at all no we have not raised at all and i feel like at this point there's no need like i feel like we've i have enough assets if that makes sense well like you know seo traffic and a mini brand of sorts and, you know, strong software, strong customer base, things like that. I can take the time to look for other growth channels. So that's kind of like the re the re triggering of the early days. Cause I think indie hackers love to create, right. And actually I'm in this, I would say the second part of the career to where I'm like, okay, we're kind of reaching the plateaus of our current, like what built V1, so to speak. And now 
I'm really excited about doing that next step. And I built it in a sustainable enough way that I don't necessarily have to use money to take that bets. It's mostly my personal time. And I also view very much taking investors is borrowing money for time. And then you now are obligated to produce for them in a short time period, right? So now you've got additional pressure to make it to 5 million, make it to 10 million where you didn't have that before. So I've said, once you've raised how much of my time is going to be creating investor reports or reporting to the board or having all of that, like, yeah. I don't have any of that now, which is probably another, practically another full-time job. And that isn't fun. That isn't like the indie hacking stuff we love to do. So, so I end every episode on three recommendations, a book, okay. a podcast, and an indie hacker entrepreneur. So a book... That I would recommend for every indie hacker is it's called Extreme Revenue Growth Podcast. Actually, a new one I started listening to that I enjoy in the marketing area is called Don't Say Content, I believe is the name. And another indie hacker, I already brought it up, but probably Monica Lent. Cool, Josh. Well, thank you so much for coming on this episode of Indie Bites. All right, bye. Thank you for listening to this episode of Indie Bites with Josh Ho. Don't forget to check out our brand new sponsor, Email Octopus, and subscribe to my newsletter, The Indie Bite. A review for the podcast goes much appreciated. All links, of course, are in the show notes. See you in the next episode.